In this course on the fundamentals of modern protective relaying, you'll receive an overview of the components of a typical electrical power system, including three-phase AC power generation and symmetrical components, zones of protection, primary and backup relaying, transducers, and overcurrent coordination for radial feeder applications. By the end of this training program, you'll be able to identify the principles and concepts of modern protective relaying, you will have reviewed commonly used terms and concepts of electricity. You will learn how to protect feeders, bus bars, transformers, generators, motors, and transmission lines. And you will also have learned how to reduce equipment damage and improve the overall quality and safety of power. On the next slide, we'll take a look at the nine modules you'll be studying in this webinar. In this course, you'll cover nine topics including a power systems overview, the fundamentals of electricity, power system protection, and current differential elements, the basics of a generator protection, transmission line protection, feeder protection, bus bar protection basics, transformer protection basics, and finally, motor protection. As part of GE's effort to reduce waste, your student materials will be delivered to you on the Kobo e-reader as an Adobe PDF. You'll use the e-reader to not only read your student material, but also be able to take notes on your reader. Mark up pages, make drawings, and add important personal notes using the tools available in the latest version of Adobe Reader. The Kobo will be yours to keep and to use in future classes at GE. Modern electrical power systems are remarkably dependable, delivering energy 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, without interruption. This is paramount in today's 24 by 7 economy. This course will present the topics within the framework of protective relays, which have an important part in assuring this continuous service. Basically, the protective relay is always ready to react instantly to protect the power systems and its components from damage and to minimize any service interruption. The following concepts will be covered throughout this initial segment of your training. Components of a power system, sources of energy, components of a generator system, transformers, transmission and subtransmission, substation components, bulk power systems. Starting at the origin of the power system, we'll briefly look at the many sources of electrical power, such as nuclear, hydroelectricity, solar, fossil fuels such as natural gas, coal and oil, and alternative sources such as solar, wind, biomass, and geothermal power generation. Though the use of these sources depends on varying factors such as location, it is important to keep in mind that the electrical power generated by any of these sources must equal the power that is consumed. In this class, we'll take a few moments to further expand our knowledge of these sources by taking a closer look at how they work and how they are protected from damage. In this module, we'll look at a typical generator system consisting of the following components, a generator, a turbine, a prime mover, and a control system. Now more to the point of this fundamentals class, we'll learn about the elements within the control system that exist, namely a synchronization unit to ensure the frequency and phase angle of the generated power matches that of the rest of the network, an automatic voltage regulator or AVR to ensure that the generator's voltage magnitude matches that of the network, a governor which acts as a speed regulator, and finally, the protective relays with current transformers that provide generator stator protection and backup protection for the automatic voltage regulator, or AVR, and the governor. Power needs to be transformed to be managed and delivered. In this class on the fundamentals of protective relaying, we'll look at how once generated, voltage is fed to step-up transformers for transmission to high-power transmission lines, which reduce the amount of current or power losses and then how and why at the substation it is stepped down for subtransmission and distribution. To this end, we'll explore in greater depth the concepts and equations associated with the power lost during transmission, transmission line times, and the resistance of the transmission. We'll cover how the step-up transformer increases the voltage level, which reduces the current, resulting in an overall reduction of power loss during transmission. In the transmission portion of Module 1, we'll look at how electricity is transmitted as a three-phase AC current over long distances through overhead power transmission lines. 
We'll discuss transmission and subtransmission voltages as they are used from the generating station to the substation and subtransmission voltages starting at the substation. While in our substation content, we'll explore in greater detail the theory, principles, and mechanics of the components of a substation by delving into the working principles and equations of power management in such devices as transformers, circuit breakers, isolators, insulators, buses, grounding, arresters, switchgear, reactors, VT and CT, and regulators. You'll gain a comprehensive understanding of the main components of the substation and transmission of power along the grid from generation to distribution to industrial, commercial, and residential consumers. Since different voltages are required for residential, commercial, and industrial customers, we'll explore the fundamentals of breakers and transformers in substations and how they route and step down the voltage to suitable levels for distribution. We'll also follow the distribution from the transmission substation, the industrial or commercial power lines that take the power above or below ground, to a large transformer which steps the three-phase voltage down to a suitable level for the plant or building. We'll switch focus to larger commercial or industrial users, gaining an understanding of the interaction of the system components as the power is routed from generation to the substation transformers via medium or low voltage switchgear to different areas of the plant or building for further distribution via switchboards and the principles that make this transmission viable and manageable. We'll also cover how the distribution system for a typical industrial or commercial user shares some similarities to that of the residential customer and the major exceptions that the power being delivered is usually three phase. Finally, we'll look at arguments for alternate transmission lines and how they may be economically justified and also how alternates for power transmission and switchgear may not make sense. Our goal is to better understand how protective relays fit into the modern power system the individual components of the power system will be reviewed in this training. In Module 2, The Fundamentals of Electricity, we will explore the theories, principles, and fundamentals of electricity, and the three types of electrical circuits and their laws. Discussed will be topics that include Ohm's Law, Measuring Current, Voltage, Resistance, and Troubleshooting Electronic Problems. By the end of Module 2, we will review the terms of electricity, Ohm's law, inductance and capacitance, review the concepts of magnetism and electromagnetism, review properties of alternating current, and explore the differences between scalars, vectors, and phasors. We'll define electricity looking at the industry definitions and the three main attributes of electricity, which all interrelate to Ohm's stated laws. You'll learn how to define electricity in terms of voltage, current, resistance, conductance, and impedance. We'll look at the basic equations necessary to understand electricity and practice working problems in class to solidify this knowledge and skill. Notably, we'll cover inductance, capacitance, and RLC circuits. Kirchhoff's law will be explored and used in understanding how voltage relates to circuits and how to calculate voltage using Kirchhoff's law. To better understand how power is generated and transformed and to more fully understand the mechanical aspects of electricity, we'll look at the law of magnetism in depth. The generation of electric power depends upon magnetism and the principles of magnets and electromagnets. We'll define and discuss magnetic flux, magnetic flux density, magnetic field intensity, magnetic permeability as it relates to the generation and transmission of electricity. One of the main concepts to be explored in this module in greater depth is the BH curve as it relates to magnetic flux density, to magnetic field intensity, and as a logarithmic function. We'll look at the interrelationship of these values as the field intensity increases and learn why there is a rapid linear increase in flux density. We will look at where saturation begins as shown by the knee of the curve and why thereafter an increase in flux intensity has little or no effect on flux density, permeability, and why a higher permeability equals a steeper slope. As we move through this module, we will continue on to the fundamentals of electromagnetism and the relationship between electricity and magnetism with special attention paid to magnetic field intensity or the strength of the magnetic field surrounding a magnet, magnetic flux, the overall collection of magnetic lines of force or flux, 
and reluctance, defined as the opposition a material exhibits towards the formation of a magnetic field. As we continue on with electromagnetism, we will look at the famous right-hand rule, the convention for determining relative directions of certain vectors, such as the direction of flux, in relation to the flow of current, as shown in the following slide. This will also relate to the topic of electromagnetism in a magnetic field that occurs when DC current is passed through any conductor. Magnetic fields of flux are created around the conductor. When magnetic fields of flux cut through a conductor, current and voltage are induced in the conductor. The magnitude of the current and voltage are proportional to strength of the magnetic field and speed at which the magnetic field cuts through the conductor. Similarly, we will investigate how a second electromagnet can be induced if brought into close proximity to another excited electromagnet, and how the induced current will create a secondary magnetic field based on the current flow of the excited electromagnet. We will review these fundamentals, and this will complete our review of electromagnetism. We'll also take a look at direct current, or DC, current flowing in one direction. Alternating current, or AC, is defined as an electrical current which constantly changes amplitude and polarity at regular intervals, and the sine wave, a fundamental waveform to the operation of alternating current circuits. Sinusoidal voltages are generated by electric power utilities. We'll uncover why the resulting more economical AC power can be easily changed by adjusting the voltage, and is used in domestic, commercial, and industrial sites by electrical, electronic, and telecommunications appliances and systems. AC generator theory of operation will be discussed in more detail and discussed in the context of amplitude, frequency, and period. We'll cover how to calculate a sinusoid's instantaneous magnitude at any angle, which can be calculated using the following equations. And we'll take a look at the relationship between sine waves with the same frequency. If two waveforms, for example 1 and 2, have the same frequency and are at the same point in their cycle at any point in time, the waveforms are said to be in phase with each other. We'll take a look at in phase in greater detail in this module. In Module 2 of the course, we'll review how a scalar is a quantity, such as length, temperature, and numbers characterized by a magnitude, for example 0 degrees Celsius, and how a vector is a quantity, such as force characterized by a magnitude and a direction, for example 400 miles per hour east. Regarding load, or the current of a reactive load that will lead or lag the applied voltage, We'll use examples to illustrate the principle that if the voltage were to be applied to a purely inductive load, the current as shown in waveform 2 in this example would lag the voltage by 90 degrees. Since the voltage is considered the reference and the positive rotation is considered to be counterclockwise, the phasor diagram shown would imply a 90 degree current lag. Similarly, if voltage were applied to a purely capacitive load, the current, as shown in waveform 3, would lead the voltage by 90 degrees, and conversely, if the negative rotation is considered to be clockwise, the phasor diagram would imply a 90 degree current lead. We'll also look at the form of power, which is known as three-phase alternating current, or three-phase power, and come to understand why it is the most efficient form to transport electrical power from generators over long distances to large industrial and commercial users. We'll look at this part as represented in vectors, their degrees of angle, and the counterclockwise rotation characteristic of this positive output sequence. In the segment on the history of power, we will look in greater detail at the work of James Watt, and how his desire to want to rate steam engines that he was producing at the time in a unit of power that his customers could relate to became a new unit of power known as the horsepower, and why it has remained as a standard unit of power rating for electrical motors in North America, while in Europe the kilowatt has become the standard. We will look at both units of measure and how they relate to the ratio of usable power consumption to reactive power consumption. In this module, we'll finally look at calculating the power factor, making use of the following three definitions. Apparent power, or the product of current and voltage of the circuit or vector summation, and real power, the capacity of the circuit to perform work in a particular time, or the power that actually powers the equipment to perform useful work. Finally, we'll look at reactive power, 
or the non-working power caused by the magnetizing current required to operate the device, such as a transformer, induction motor, and induction generator. The goal of any electric utility company is to have a power factor of 1, or unity power factor. If the power factor is less than 1, more current supply is required by the user for a given amount of power usage. Therefore, the utility incurs more line losses and requires larger equipment capacity. For the customer, uncorrected power factor causes power system losses in the distribution system, which may lead to excessive voltage drops and cause overheating and premature failure of motors and other inductive equipment. To understand power factor, a good analogy is to visualize a horse pulling a railroad car down a railroad track. If the horse is pulling a railroad car forwards at an angle along the side of the track, the following power components exist. One, working or real power is the power required to move the railroad car along the track. Number two, total or apparent power is the angular pulling effort of the horse. Number three, non-working or reactive power is the wasted perpendicular pulling effort of the horse since the railroad car will not move off the laid track. Modern electrical power systems are remarkably dependable, delivering energy 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, without interruption. Protective relays have an important part in assuring this continuous service. The third module of our Fundamentals of Modern Protective Relaying course provides an overview of power systems protection. This section answers the question as to why power systems need protection, as well as causes for faults and an introduction to symmetrical components. Power systems need protection to reduce equipment damage and power interruptions while improving power quality and safety for all. To ensure maximum return on investment and reliability of service, to satisfy customers, every component of a power system needs to be kept in operation. These demands are accomplished as follows. Each component of the power system is specified, designed, and maintained to prevent a failure. However, due to the economic considerations of design and maintenance procedures, this may not be feasible or realistic. Therefore, power systems have also been designed to control and minimize the effects of any failures. This is where the protective relay fits into the power system. The protective relay is the device which operates and signals to disconnect a faulty part of the power system, thereby protecting that faulted part and the remainder of the system from damage. There are many causes of power system faults, such as lightning, wind, ice, and snowstorms, to name a few. Whether faults are intermittent or permanent in nature, the protective system must be able to sense the fault and take appropriate actions within a certain time frame to minimize as much damage as possible. Let's take a few moments to further elaborate on the key differences of intermittent and permanent faults. What is an intermittent fault? An intermittent fault can be regarded by using an example of lightning striking the transmission line forming an arc, which can be seen in the form of a light flicker from the reclosure. What is a permanent fault? A permanent fault is physical damage to a power system component such as the transmission line. The theory of symmetrical components goes well beyond the scope of the contents delivered throughout this module. The intent of delivering the concepts throughout this next section serves as an introduction to the concepts of symmetrical components, giving you a better understanding of how modern microprocessor relays operate. Symmetrical components is the name given to a methodology which was discovered in 1913 by Charles Leggett Fortescue, who later presented a paper on his findings entitled Method of Symmetrical Coordinates Applied to the Solution of Polyphase Networks. Fortescue demonstrated that any set of unbalanced three-phase quantities could be expressed as the sum of three symmetrical sets of balanced phasors. Using this tool, unbalanced system conditions, like those used by common fault types, may be visualized and analyzed. Additionally, most microprocessor-based relays operate from symmetrical component quantities, and so the importance of a good understanding of this tool is self-evident. According to Fortescue's methodology, there are three sets of independent components in a three-phase system, positive, negative, and zero for both current and voltage. Positive sequence voltages are represented by phasors of equal magnitude and displaced 120 degrees apart, rotating in a counterclockwise direction of A, B, C, 
and they are supplied by generators within the system and are always present. Similarly, a second set of balanced phasors are also equal in magnitude and displaced 120 degrees apart, but with a counterclockwise rotation sequence of ACB, which represents a negative sequence. The final set of balanced phasors are equal in magnitude and in phase with each other. However, since there is no rotation sequence, this is known as a zero sequence. Within Fortescue's formulas, the alpha operator shifts a vector by an angle of 120 degrees counterclockwise, and the alpha squared operator performs a 240 degree counterclockwise phase shift. In a balanced symmetrical system, the symmetrical components, positive, negative, and zero, are independent from each other, although they are interrelated to the three phase vectors, a, b, and c. However, in an unbalanced, non-symmetrical system, such as an unsymmetrical fault or open phase, the symmetrical components become intertwined. In a balanced symmetrical system, the positive sequence current flow produces only positive sequence voltage drops. No negative or zero sequence drops are evident. In a negative sequence, the current flow produces only negative sequence voltage drops with no positive or zero sequence drops. The zero sequence current flows produce only zero sequence voltage drops, no positive or negative sequence drops. In an unbalanced or non-symmetrical system, the positive or negative sequence current flow produces positive, negative, and possibly zero sequence voltage drops. Zero sequence current flowing in an unbalanced system produces all three, positive, negative, and zero sequence voltage drops. In practice, for a three-phase winding, a positive sequence set of currents produces a normal rotating field. A negative sequence produces a field with the opposite rotation, and the zero sequence set produces a field that oscillates but does not rotate. Since these effects can be detected physically, the mathematical tool became the basis for the design of protection relays, which used negative sequence voltages and currents as a reliable indicator of fault conditions. Such relays may be used to trip circuit breakers or take other steps to protect electrical systems. Welcome to Module 4, Generator Protection. In this module, we'll focus on the theories of both single and three-phase synchronous generators, along with a general overview of grounding and common grounding schemes. This segment of your learning concludes with taking a closer look at a typical a single phase generator is comprised of two major components, an exciter, which is an electromagnet that rotates about on its axis as shown, and a stator, constructed from two electromagnets or poles wired in series to a load and is, as the name implies, remains stationary. One rotation of the exciter through 360 degrees produces one cycle of voltage that alternates polarity and hence current flow. This is referred to as alternating current or AC power. For a single phase generator, the output voltage over one complete rotation of the exciter is shown above. The generator is constructed based on a perfect sine wave by plotting the output voltage or V output on the vertical axis and the angular position on the horizontal axis. Therefore, the sine function can be used to calculate the output voltage at any given angle as follows. V output equals V max sine Q, where V max is the peak output voltage. The poles of a three phase generator would be positioned such that the pole pairs are directly opposite each other and planes running through any two pairs of poles will intersect at an angle of 120 degrees. This arrangement of poles forms the stator of a two pole three phase generator. Stator has two electromagnetic poles per phase. One side of the windings from each pair of poles, A2, B2, and C2, is connected together and grounded, while the other side, A1, B1, C1, is connected to the three-phase load. Plotting a graph of the voltage that appears across each load resistor against time, the waveforms intersect as shown above. As the exciter rotates, the voltage induced in each pair of stator windings is displaced by 120 electrical degrees from the other two pair, which corresponds to the physical angular position of the stator windings. The resulting output is composed of three sine waves of equal amplitude, but with 120 degrees phase shift between them. 
Generators are very expensive and need to be grounded to decrease the level of fault current flowing back into the generator during a ground fault condition. The total cost of unscheduled downtime for a repair must include the loss in production. The most costly and time-consuming repair is metal damage to the steel laminations forming the stator and rotor. If the fault current is limited to or less than 10 amps, metal damage will be minimal. The grounding strategy employed is the key factor in determining the magnitude of the fault current. There are several grounding schemes or strategies commonly used to protect a generator. These grounding schemes are based on the magnitude of the fault current, ease of detection, and the reaction time to minimize damage. Let's take a few moments to learn about a few of the generator grounding schemes. The high resistance scheme uses a grounding transformer and a resistor connected across the secondary as shown. With large generators, a distribution transformer is used as a grounding transformer. Ground fault neutralizer grounding, also known as a Peterson coil, uses a reactor instead of a resistor on the secondary, which can be adjusted. Generally, high impedance schemes limit the primary current between 3 to 25 amps, while the Peterson coil is capable of limiting the fault current to 1 amp. Generators that use low resistance grounding have their neutral grounded through a resistance such that typical fault currents are in the range of 200 amps to 150 percent of rated full load current. The cost and size of the resistor usually precludes the use of resistors to limit phase to ground fault current below 200 amps. This type of grounding is used where two or more generators are bussed at generator voltage and connected to a system through one step-up transformer and where the generator is connected directly to a distribution system having a low impedance grounding source on the generator bus. Generators that use reactance grounding have their neutral grounded through an inductive reactance such that typical fault currents are in the range of 25 to 100 percent of three-phase current. This type of grounding is used where the generator is connected directly to a solid grounded distribution system. Generators that use zero impedance grounding have extremely high fault currents, which are very easy to detect. At the time of fault, there is a lot of fault energy, and so the reaction time to the fault has to be very fast to limit damage. The elements required to detect fault currents include IOC and TOC. This type of grounding is popular in marine applications and in some areas of Europe. At the time of a ground fault, there is no fault current flow, and so the reaction time can be slow. Detection is difficult due to the lack of current. Voltage elements, such as neutral displacement, are typically used to detect such faults. In addition to the mechanical arrangement, a typical generator system will consist of a synchronized unit, an automatic voltage regulator, and a protective relay. The synchronization unit measures frequency and phase angle of the network and sends a feedback signal to the primary generator speed regulator. For example, the gas valve controller of a natural gas generator increases or decreases the speed of the generator to sync the generator's output frequency to the network. Once the generator is in synchronization, the synchronization circuits will provide an in-sync signal output. The automatic voltage regulator sums the negative feedback of the output voltage of the generator with the network. The error signal is then fed to the generator field current regulator, which increases or decreases the field strength such that the generator voltage magnitude matches that of the network. And lastly, the protective relay is connected to the generator stator circuit and provides generator stator protection in addition to backup protection for the AVR and in Module 5, Transmission Line Protection, we'll cover the importance of transmission lines in a power system. Transmission lines are responsible for transmitting large amounts of current at potentially very high voltages. If a fault occurs on a transmission line and it is not cleared properly and quickly, the stability of the entire system can be compromised. The longer that the fault is allowed to remain on the line, the higher the possibility that the system will become unstable. The following concepts will be covered throughout this segment of your training transmission line theory, and line protection elements. By the end of Module 5, Transmission Line Protection, you'll be able to define the four main classifications of transmission lines, 
present the broad categories of line configuration, and discuss the various types of protection schemes that are employed. You'll be able to define the coordination needed for selective tripping and isolation of faulty circuits. You'll also be able to describe the configuration, the function they perform, and their location in the system of transmission lines. We'll learn the characteristics of lines and how a transmission line is a circuit that is used to transmit power from one location to another. These transmission lines can span short distances of a few hundred meters to very long distances of hundreds of kilometers. We'll take a look at two techniques of line protection, which include distance relaying and line current differential, and we'll review all of the factors that must be considered when determining the best method of protecting the transmission line. Next, we'll look at line classification in a power system. That area which constitutes a transmission line is defined by well-defined boundaries. The physical location of a line boundary is often called a terminal. The terminal, which defines the end of a transmission line, can be a switch, breaker, bus, or transformer. A terminal is a physical location of a line boundary. A switch, breaker, bus, or transformer defines the end of a transmission line. Transmission lines can be broken down into one of four main classifications that describe their configuration, the function they perform, and the location in the system. Parallel lines describe a configuration where multiple transmission lines run side by side. This is done to transmit large amounts of power from one location to another, in addition to providing a redundant path for power in case one of the lines was shut down due to a fault. Other line configurations we'll touch upon are interconnector transmission lines, general export transmission lines, process plant load transmission lines. Transmission lines are classified into three categories that describe the presences of generation or possible sources of fault current that might be found at the transmission line's boundaries. These are single-ended, double-ended, and multi-ended. Sometimes the transmission line itself will be tapped to provide a source of power to a load. Distance protection is one method of protecting a transmission line in this configuration and will be covered in detail later in this course. Transmission lines are also classified into three categories. They are for distribution, 2 kilovolts to 50 kilovolts, for subtransmission, 30 kilovolts to 150 kilovolts, and for transmission, more than 100 kilovolts. Most line distance protection applications are more than 50 kilovolts. Distance protection is one method of protecting a transmission line in this configuration and will be covered in detail later in this course. The length of a transmission line can also be classified into three categories of length. Short transmission lines are less than 80 kilometers in length. Medium transmission lines are roughly between 80 kilometers and 240 kilometers. Long transmission lines are greater than 240 kilometers in length. Another important topic of discussion will be inductance and shunt capacitance. Transmission lines have a certain amount of inductive losses due to the inductive nature of transmission lines. Shunt capacitance occurs between the transmission lines and ground. This capacitance counterbalances some of the inductance by adding leading MVARs on the line, which helps bring the current and voltage back to unity power factor. We'll look at calculating the magnitude of current that will flow through the transmission line at the time of the fault, and configuring accurate settings for distance relays. This is a very important task that the protection engineer must perform in order to ensure that the transmission line is properly protected. In order to do this, the protection engineer must first calculate the system impedance ratio, or SIR, and develop an equivalent electrical model of the transmission line. Therefore, you'll learn how to consider this when determining the type of protection needed and the speed that the faults need to be cleared by relaying. Each component in a power system, whether it be a source or transmission line, or a load, has an impedance. The total system impedance limits the magnitude of current that will flow through the power system. Each component in a power system, whether it be a source or transmission line, or a load, has an impedance. The total system impedance limits the magnitude of current that will flow through the power system. Distance relays are programmed to know the impedance to the end of the transmission line. To program distance relays, the impedance of the line needs to be configured, 
where any impedance less than this value will indicate a faulted line. This is done in modern distance relays by creating zones of operation on the RX diagram. When a fault occurs on the power system, thus cutting off the path of current to some of the load, the impedance of the power system will decrease. This decrease in impedance will cause the current to increase and the voltage to decrease slightly, thus changing the ratio of the voltage over the current to match the new impedance of the line. You'll learn how to calculate the ratio of voltage over current or impedance and why it will decrease significantly. Distance relays are programmed to know the impedance to the end of the transmission line. To program distance relays, the impedance of the line needs to be configured where any impedance less than this value will indicate a faulted line. This is done in modern distance relays by creating zones of operation on the RX diagram. If the impedance calculated at the point of measurement of the power system ever falls within this zone, the relay will trip. These zones fit into the following operating characteristics. Impedance zone, admittance or MHO circle zone, reactant zone, resistance zone, quadrilateral zone. We'll take a look at each one of these operating characteristics or in distance relaying operating zones. You'll also investigate the zone of protection known as an impedance zone. This is where any impedance that falls within the radius of the circle indicates a fault that needs to be cleared and is measured in ohms. This will also indicate the distance down the power system within which the zone of protection extends. This type of zone is inherently non-directional and will detect faults that occur in the reverse direction away from the point of measurement. This type of impedance zone is normally used for generator backup protection. We'll also review the reactance zone used to detect when the impedance of the fault has a very high resistive component in it and if the fault has a high resistive impedance. This indicates that there is a load on the transmission line and the fault is most likely not on the transmission line itself. This type of zone is usually never used to trip a transmission line on its own, but is normally used to supervise another distance zone of protection. Another zone of protection we will look at is also known as the resistance zone. This is used to detect when the impedance of the fault has a very high inductive component in it. This type of zone is usually never used to trip a transmission line on its own, but is normally used to supervise another distance zone of protection and we'll cover why this is in this configuration. The resistance zone would be giving the impedance zone permission to trip. The next zone we will study is known as an admittance zone or an MHO circle zone which is the most common type of protection zone that is used in transmission line distance relays. An MHO circle zone detects whenever the impedance of the transmission line falls within the area defined by the circle. This type of zone is inherently directional and will not detect faults that fall in the reverse direction of the transmission line since that point will fall outside of the circle. The reach of the zone of protection zone shows in an impedance how far down the transmission lines this zone of protection will protect. Many advanced microprocessor based relays such as the URD60 give the user the ability to further customize the shape of the MHO zone to meet their protection needs. The MHO zone can be altered to form a lenticular shape which looks at the magnitude of the impedance and only allows tripping when the impedance falls very close to the angle of the transmission line impedance. Therefore, highly loaded systems which cause the impedance point to approach very close to the origin will not result in tripping the transmission line. We'll also take a good detailed look at several other zone of protection schemes such as distance relay tomato zone of protection, distance relay quadrilateral zone of protection, distance relay enhanced MHO element zone of protection. In modern distance protection zones we can also set to have an MHO or quadrilateral shape protection characteristic and the operating characteristics of each zone can be set individually. We'll look at this strategy used to detect and clear faults occurring on a transmission line. The relay accomplishes this type of protection by measuring the current and voltage and using this information to calculate the impedance of the line. 
which is expressed as Z measures equals voltage over current. As indicated by the fault number 1, if the measured impedance, the Z measured 1, is less than the known actual impedance of the line, Z actual, this indicates a fault since the line is now shorter than expected. We'll touch upon why, due to the inherent inaccuracies of CTs and VTs, the impedance calculations made by the distance relays cannot be guaranteed to be extremely accurate. Zones of protection can also be programmed to protect in either the forward direction or reverse direction. This is called looking into the line, where the zones are set to protect in the forward direction, or looking out of the line, where zones are set to protect in the reverse direction. The strategy used to protect a line is commonly referred to as a scheme. All protection schemes used in distance relaying fit into one of the following two categories, pilot-aided schemes and non-pilot-aided schemes. The main difference between the two types of schemes is that the distance relays used in pilot-aided schemes communicate with each other to determine whether the fault is located on the transmission line or not. The relays used in non-pilot-aided schemes do not communicate with each other, but use delays and other forms of coordination to determine whether the fault is located on the transmission line or not, and all coordination in these schemes is done within each individual relay itself. The basic non-pilot-aided schemes we will study are non-pilot-aided distance scheme, stepped distance is the basic structure for all other distance schemes, the stepped distance scheme uses five different zones of protection to protect its own transmission line and to act as a backup distance relay to protect transmission lines that are located next to it. Zone 1, underreaching. This is a scheme set to underreach and extend from the beginning of the transmission line to 80 or 90 percent of the length of the entire line. In Zone 2, overreaching. This is set to overreach and extends from the beginning of the transmission line past the end of line 1 and into the next adjoining transmission line, or line 2. The third zone of protection is set to overreach past the end of the second adjacent transmission line. This third zone is used to act as a backup for the next adjacent transmission line in case the protection on that transmission line fails. The other type of non-pilot-aided scheme that we will discuss is the Zone 1 Extension Scheme. The Zone 1 Extension Scheme is an enhancement to the Stepped Distance Scheme covered in the previous slides. We'll learn why this protection scheme operates on the principle that most transmission line faults are transient in nature, which means that the fault is not permanent. In summary, we'll review why all pilot-aided schemes speed up the clearing of faults that occur on the transmission line and inside the end zone of the local relay by communicating with the relay at the remote end of the line to determine if the fault is actually on the transmission line. Also in this module, we'll look at all pilot-aided schemes which are used to reduce the amount of time needed to wait before clearing a fault that occurs at the end zone of a transmission line and have the following characteristics. Five zones of protection to operate as a standard stepped distance application. A communication channel setup between the distance relays at each end of the line. We'll briefly cover the characteristics of the most common pilot-aided schemes. The DUT, or D-U-T-T, also known as the Direct Underreaching Transfer Trip Scheme. The PUTT, or P-U-T-T, or Permissive Underreaching Transfer Trip Scheme. The POT, or Permissive Overreaching Transfer Trip Scheme. The Hybrid P-O-T-T, POT, Hybrid Permissive Overreaching Transfer Trip Scheme and the DCB or Directional Comparison Blocking Scheme. Lastly, we'll take a look at the DSUB or DCUB, better known as the Directional Comparison Unblocking Scheme. The last subject that will be covered in distance relaying is power swing blocking. Now, a stable power swing can be seen as a condition where the system loses synchronism for a short period of time with the neighboring system and then later regains synchronism. There are two reasons which can cause this type of power swing, and they are as follows. One of the systems, which loses a significant amount of generation, instantly becomes much weaker, but the load on the system remains constant. 
The next is the system is already weak and the load suddenly increases substantially. During a power swing, the voltages and currents will fluctuate, which significantly affects the value of the measured impedance on the line. Now with the advent of high-speed, low-cost LAN technology, line current differential relaying is becoming more and more popular for the following reasons. Immunity to power swings, speed, sensitivity, and as a form of unit protection. Zone of protection covering the complete power system components without overreaching. Line current differential relaying measures and compares the current at both ends of the line using two separate relays and a communication link. The zone of protection is the segment of the line between the two sets of CTs, hence the term unit protection applies. Theoretically, the sum of the two currents should be zero. If there is a difference beyond a reasonable amount, the relays will trip their respective breakers to isolate the line since there is apparently a fault on the line. However, to enhance reliability, modern utility class line current differential relays will also provide built-in backup distance protection in the event there is a communication link failure. Welcome to Module 6, Feeder Protection. Feeder protection is a broad term that refers to subtransmission lines and distribution circuit protection. Subtransmission is a term that refers to lower voltage transmission lines that connect the transmission system to the distribution system. The distribution circuits connect the subtransmission system to the utilization apparatus. The issues surrounding subtransmission and distribution system protection are very similar. In feeder applications, a very common requirement is to remove a component if the amount of current flowing into the component exceeds certain levels over certain amounts of time. The time and instantaneous overcurrent elements provide this protection functionality. Both elements require only one measured system quantity, current, which is plotted on the x-axis. The x-axis is in multiples of Let's take a look at the operating characteristic of a single measured quantity. The operating characteristic will take the form of a graph with the measured power system quantity plotted on the x-axis against the time, which is on the y-axis. The graph, or operating characteristic curve, clearly demarcates the boundaries between three regions. None operate region, which is the element which will not operate when the intersection of the time and the measured quantity falls within this area. The operate region, which is where the element will operate when the intersection of the two measured quantities falls within this area. The plotted curve, which is the boundary between the operate and non-operate regions. The element will operate if the measured quantity and time intersect on this curve. Pickup, which is the minimum value of the measured quantity that will cause the element to operate, and the x-axis in multiples of the pickup. As stated earlier, the y-axis is in units of time. The curve represents the boundary between the operate area, the area at and above the curve, and the non-operate area, the area below the curve and to the left of the pickup. The instantaneous overcurrent, or IOC, protective element, operates when the current has exceeded a pre-programmed level. The relay will require some short time to operate, as shown in the graph. The diagram shown in figure 1-0 illustrates that the time overcurrent protective element, device number 51, is used where more time delay before the element operates is required to coordinate with other protective relays. The trip time varies inversely with current. Within a microprocessor based relay, the element will typically support several characteristic curves. The family of curves most commonly used in North America are called inverse, very inverse and extremely inverse characteristic curves. In other parts of the world, different sets of curves are used and so the universal relay supports various sets of families of curves in addition to creating custom curves. During the selection of the curve, the protection engineer will use what is termed as a time multiplier to effectively shift the curve up or down on the time axis. The x-axis will be multiples of pickup the pickup setting allows the normalization of the curve to the pickup setting value. An example of this is displayed in figure 1.1. Operating characteristic curves are useful for determining the relay settings. These settings will provide the necessary speed, selectivity, and sensitivity to protect the power system and coordinate with other protective devices. 
The setting of a series of time overcurrent elements on a feeder or distribution circuit begins at the point furthest downstream from the generating source. As the elements are set and coordinated back upstream toward the generating sources, the time required to clear a fault becomes longer as the source is approached. Under certain fault conditions, this could be a disadvantage. And so instantaneous overcurrent elements are used in conjunction with the time overcurrent elements to provide high-speed primary protection. These elements must be set to pick up under maximum fault current conditions for the three-phase faults, somewhat short of the end of the first line. The improvement in tripping time can be obtained with an instantaneous element. The shaded area of the figure illustrates the difference in the opening time between the time and instantaneous overcurrent elements. In many areas of the distribution system, fuses, which are the most economical form of overcurrent protection, are used in many locations in conjunction with protective relays. Therefore, coordination must be reviewed for issues that arise when coordinating protection between fuses and between fuses and relays. Protection of power system bus bars are one of the most critical relaying applications and are in areas of power systems where fault current levels may be very high. In spite of that, some of the circuits connected to the bus may have their current transformers, or CTs, insufficiently rated. This creates a danger of significant current transformer saturation and jeopardizes security of the bus bar protection system. This module will cover the various types of bus bar configurations along with bus bar requirements and protection techniques. A single bus has a distribution of lower voltage levels and no operating flexibility. This type of bus has fault on the bus trips and all circuit breakers. The multiple bus sections has a single breaker and bus tie that also has lower distribution of voltage levels but limited operating flexibility. The double bus single breaker with bus tie is the most common arrangement with transmission and distribution mid-voltage levels. This is breaker maintenance without circuit removal or bypasser. This type of bus also has a fault on a bus that disconnects only the circuits being connected to that specific bus. Main and transfer buses have an increased operating flexibility and has a bus fault that requires tripping all breakers. The double bus has a high operating flexibility and line protection that covers the part between the two current transformers. Fault on a bus does not disturb the power of the circuits. The brake and a half bus is used on higher voltage levels and has more operating flexibility. This bus requires more breakers and the middle sections are covered by the line protection. The last image is of a ring bus, which has higher voltage levels and high operating flexibility with minimum breakers. Separate bus protection is not required as the line protections cover overlapped bus parts. Power system bus bars vary significantly as to the size, or number of circuits connected, complexity, number of sections, tie breakers, disconnectors, etc., and voltage levels, transmission or distribution level. A simple protection for distribution bus bars can be accomplished as an interlocking scheme. Overcurrent or OC relays are placed on an incoming circuit and at all outgoing feeders. The feeder OCs are set to sense the fault currents on the feeders. The OC on the incoming circuit is set to trip the bus bar unless blocked by any of the feeder OC relays. A short coordination timer is typically required to avoid race conditions. Typically, a differential circuit is created externally to a current sensor by summation of all the circuit currents. Preferably, the CTs should be of the same ratio. If they are not, a matching CT or several CTs is needed. This, in turn, may increase the burden for the main CTs and make the saturation problem even more serious. Percent differential relays create a restraining signal in addition to the differential signal and apply a percent restrained characteristic. The choices of the restraining signal include sum, average, and maximum of the bus currents. The choices of the characteristic include typical single slope and double slope characteristics. A linear coupler, or air core mutual reactor, produces its output voltage proportional to the derivative of the input current. Because they are using air cores, linear couplers, 
do not saturate. Welcome to Module 8, Transformer Protection. To better understand how protective relays fit into the modern power system, the makeup of the power system will continue to be reviewed. By the end of Module 8, you will have reviewed Transformer Theory and Principles, how to compare transformer configurations, how to identify power transformer types, and how to identify transformer components. You'll also be able to list transformer protection elements, describe transformer differential protection, and identify differential restraint characteristics. The following concepts will be covered throughout this segment of your training. Transformer theory and transformer configurations. Power transformers are very expensive devices which enable the transmission of power over long distances. The transformer is based on the principles of electromagnetism and electromagnetic induction. As we know, a transformer is a device that transfers electrical energy from one circuit to another through a shared magnetic field based on the principles of electromagnetism. In this module, we'll look at how a change in current in the primary circuit changes the magnetic field, which induces a voltage change in the secondary circuit. With a load added to the secondary circuit, current flows and transfers energy from the primary to the secondary circuit. Therefore, transformers, which consist of a primary set of windings and one or more sets of secondary windings, are used to isolate, phase shift, and or step the voltage up or down. We'll look at how the primary and secondary coils are wrapped around an iron core with high magnetic permeability, which ensures that most of the magnetic field lines produced by the primary current are within the iron and passes through the secondary and primary coil. As we continue with transformer theory, We'll look at power transformer voltages and why transformers are rated by their maximum primary and secondary voltage relationship, as well as their power carrying limits based on their voltage and current limits. We'll look at the common types of transformers. Generation step up or GSU transformers, transmission step down transformers, distribution substation transformers, distribution small transformers, auto transformers, voltage regulating transformers, phase angle regulating transformers, Scott transformers, reactors, and finally split phase auto transformers. As we drill down into transformer types, we'll spend time looking at the auto transformer, which consists of a single tapped inductor coil used to step up or step down voltage like a transformer, except without providing electrical isolation. An auto transformer is a transformer that uses a common winding for both the primary and secondary windings. Auto transformers are used in places of the power system where small step down or step up voltage is needed. Essentially, an inductor with a center tap, an auto transformer is often used in power supply boost converter applications to achieve a higher output voltage. Before we exit the section on auto transformers, we'll look at the relative amount of power transformed and power transferred depending upon the ratio of transformation. We will briefly cover the numerous types of smaller transformers used in distribution. We'll look at one of the key elements in the transformer makeup, the Buchholz relay. This relay looks for bubbles of air which are caused by winding faults in the foil between the transformer tank and reservoir. We'll look at how it works in detail and its variations and applications in modern transformers. Another relay that we'll look at is the sudden pressure relay which detects excessive rates of pressure rise within the tank as a result of internal arcing. A seal-in circuit is also available for tripping the transformer offline. As we move through transformers, we'll explore how the load currents through the resistances of the primary and secondary windings create losses that heat up the copper wires in the transformers and cause voltage drops. Two concepts that we'll review are hysteresis, which is each time the magnetic field is reversed, there is a small amount of energy lost, and the eddy. This is generated naturally when there is a change in the direction of the magnetic field. Current circulates through the core in a plane normal to the flux and is responsible for resistive heating of the core. Finally, we'll look at the function of frequency and the inverse square of material thickness. One of the most important set of concepts we'll review in this category are known as external faults, such as overloads, overvoltage, underfrequency, and external system short circuits. We'll also cover active faults, such as 
short circuit in Y-connected windings, short circuits in delta windings, phase-to-phase -phase faults, turn-to-turn -turn faults, core faults, and finally, tank faults. We'll also investigate overvoltages, underfrequency, external system shortcuts, and finally, internal transformer faults such as overheating, overfluxing, and overpressure. One key concept that is explored in this training is transformer differential protection, which compares the current going into the transformer against the current leaving the transformer, taking into account turns ratio, which is a built-in relay compensation, which looks at mismatch of each side, and phase shift, another built-in relay compensation, sometimes called phase angle comparison. You'll understand why differential protection offers the most sensitive form of protection, because it limits the zone of protection to the power apparatus, for example, the transformer. As we go deeper into differential protection, specifically 87T, we'll define active internal faults as detected by 87T protection, such as phase-to-phase -phase faults, three-phase faults, ground faults, core faults, and once again, tank faults. As we look deeper into transformer windings, we'll see how they will saturate if subjected to prolonged overvoltage, and how for maximum efficiency, transformers are operated near the knee of the iron saturation curve, such that slight overvoltage will result in a significant exciting current. The volts per hertz protection element is set up as a backup to the generator control system. We'll cover other transformer differential protection factors such as arc detection using the Buchholz relay to detect a sudden large increase in the amount of gas being produced, which corresponds to a large fault where the relay will trip the transformer offline, and arc detection using a sudden pressure sensor, which is used in oil-immersed transformers and have two styles of sudden pressure sensors, a sensor which operates on a sudden change in oil, and a sensor which operates on a sudden change in the gas above the oil. Both sensors are inverse time characteristics. Therefore, they will operate very quickly to trip the transformer for a high energy arc and operate slower as possibly just an alarm for a low energy arc. The transformer differential protection factors we'll spend time on are magnetizing inrush, over excitation, or the heating up of the transformer and degrading of the insulation, volts over hertz, arc detection using a Buchholz relay, air and gas bubbles, arc detection using the sudden pressure sensor, and finally, restricted ground fault protection. The primary motor protective element within a motor protective relay is the thermal overload element, and within GE Multilin relays, this is accomplished through motor thermal modeling. The thermal model uses motor parameters supplied by the manufacturer in addition to real-time data such as motor current as inputs to a thermal modeling algorithm. The algorithm then calculates whether the motor is or is not in danger of being overheated. It's also important to note that for some customers, their process is more important than the machine due to the nature of their business. This module will walk you through a brief overview of the mechanical makeup of a stator, as well as provide you with some knowledge revolving around motor efficiency and key elements of the motor thermal model. The heart of a three-phase AC motor is made up of two main components, the rotor and the stator. The stator, which is made up of numerous poles, creates a rotating magnetic field when AC current and voltage are applied. The poles of the stator are arranged in pairs with each of the poles wired in series and located on opposite sides of the stator. The resulting magnetic fields in each pair of stator parts will be 120 degrees apart. Each pair represents one phase of the three phase currents. Therefore, a two pole motor will have two poles, or one pair, for each of the three phases. The heart of a three-phase AC motor is made up of two main components, the rotor and the stator. The stator, which is made up of numerous poles, creates a rotating magnetic field when AC current and voltage are applied. The poles of the stator are arranged in pairs with each of the poles wired in series and located on opposite sides of the stator. 
The resulting magnetic fields in each pair of stator parts will be 120 degrees apart. Each pair represents one phase of the three-phase currents. Therefore, a two-pole motor will have two poles, or one pair, for each of the three phases. Each pair of stator poles is wired in series, but with current flowing in opposite directions through the magnets, this will produce an opposite magnetic polarity on each pole. If phase A is one of the three phases at a zero crossing, then there will be no current injected to produce a magnetic field on that stator pole. Phase C has positive current applied, creating a north field on the primary pole and a south field on the secondary pole. Phase B has a negative current applied, creating a south field on the primary pole and a north pole on the secondary pole. The combined magnetic fields of B and C will produce a vector of force. Rotating the current waveforms by 60 degrees will cause the vector of force to rotate by 60 degrees as well. A continuous AC waveform will therefore cause the magnetic field of the stator to rotate constantly. A permanent magnet AC motor uses a magnet mounted freely in the center of the stator, positioned so that the magnet will rotate about its axis. The north and south poles of the magnet will be attracted and repelled by the north and south poles of the stator field, producing a torque and causing the magnet to rotate. Permanent magnet motors tend to be very small, less than 20 horsepower. A longer body with a smaller diameter stator results in a lower moment of inertia. Permanent magnet AC motors will spin at synchronous speeds. Therefore, these motors are typically used for high-speed positioning applications, such as motion controllers. Torque is the applied force which causes an object to rotate. Motor efficiency is an indication of how much of the electrical energy supplied to the motor is converted into output shaft mechanical energy and is expressed as a percentage. The rest of the energy is lost primarily in the form of heat, which can be damaging to the motor's insulation. There are five categories of motor losses. Core losses are comprised of two components, the energy required to magnetize the core and eddy current losses in the stator core. Stator losses due to the I squared R heating of the stator due to current flow in the stator windings. Rotator losses due to the I squared R heating of rotor bars as induced current flows. Friction and winding losses due to bearing and air friction on the rotor. Stray load losses due primarily to leakage reactance fluxes induced by the load current. Core, stator, and rotor losses typically make up greater than 80% of all total motor losses. The primary motor protective element within a motor protective relay is the thermal overload element, and within GE Multilin relays, this is accomplished through motor thermal modeling. The thermal model uses motor parameters supplied by manufacturers in addition to real-time data such as motor current as inputs to a thermal modeling algorithm. The algorithm then calculates whether the motor is or is not in danger of being overheated. The most precise way to protect a motor is through the use of motor thermal modeling, and it consists of five key elements. The motor thermal limits curve, overload pickup level, hot-cold safe stall mode, unbalanced bias compensation, and biasing of the thermal model based on hot-cold motor information and measured stator temperature. Throughout the next few slides, we'll take a few moments to better familiarize ourselves with these terms by taking a closer look at defining motor thermal limits curve, thermal overload, hot-cold ratios, and unbalanced biasing. The motor thermal limits curve consists of three distinct segments, which are based on the three running conditions of a motor. The locked rotor or stall condition, motor acceleration, motor running overload. Ideally, curves have been provided for both a hot and cold motor. A hot motor is defined as one that has been running for a period of time at full load, such that the stator and room temperatures have settled at their rated temperature. Conversely, a cold motor is defined as a motor that has been stopped for a period of time, such that the rotor and stator temperatures have settled at ambient temperature. For most motors, the motor thermal limits are formed into one smooth homogeneous curve. 
The primary motor protective element within a motor protective relay is the thermal overload element, and within GE Multilin relays, this is accomplished through motor thermal modeling. The thermal model uses motor parameters supplied by manufacturers in addition to real-time data such as motor current as inputs to a thermal modeling algorithm. The algorithm then calculates whether the motor is or is not in danger of being overheated. The most precise way to protect a motor is through the use of motor thermal modeling. It consists of five key elements. The hot-cold curve ratio can be determined from either the thermal limits curve, if provided, or from the hot and cold safe stall times. If the hot and cold safe stall times are used to determine the hot-cold ratio, simply divide the hot safe stall time by the cold safe stall time. If the thermal limits curve are being used to determine the hot-cold ratio, proceed as follows. From the thermal limits curve, run a line perpendicular to the current axis that intersects the hot and cold curves at the stall point. Draw a line from each point of intersection to the time axis. Record the corresponding times. In this case, 10 and 15 seconds, respectively. A balanced three-phase system is one in which the phase vectors are 120 degrees apart and of equal magnitude. If either condition is not met, the system is considered unbalanced. The amount of unbalance is calculated by comparing the positive sequence current to the negative sequence current. Negative sequence currents, or unbalanced phase currents, will cause additional rotor heating that will not be accounted for by electromechanical relays and may not be accounted for in some electronic protective relays. When the motor is running, the rotor will rotate in the direction of the positive sequence current at near synchronous speed. Negative sequence current, which has a phase rotation that is opposite to the positive sequence current and hence opposite to the rotor rotation, will generate a rotor voltage that will produce a substantial rotor current. Thank you for attending our Fundamentals of Modern Protective Relaying webinar. For further information on attending our four-day in-class program, please be sure to visit our online store.